Welcome everybody to Legal Tech Week for July 16th, 2021, our uh, usually weekly roundtable where we round up the uh, top stories of the week in legal tech and legal innovation and uh, whatever else strikes our fancy. I am Bob Ambrogi uh, of the blog Law Sites, where I cover legal tech and innovation. And our panelists today, as you see them before you, uh, go around. Steve, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, Steve Embry. I uh, publish the blog Tech Law Crossroads about legal innovation and uh, technology. Prior to that, I was a practicing lawyer in a big law firm, and uh, I live in Louisville, Kentucky, where it's stormy and rainy today. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Victoria. Hi, everyone. My name is Victoria Hudgens. I'm a reporter for Legal Tech News slash ALM where I cover technology, cybersecurity, and data privacy. And in Philadelphia, it's a very sunny and humid 93 degrees. And uh, Victor Lee, what's the weather where you are? Um, <laughs> partly cloudy with, actually no, it is partly cloudy here today. Um, my name is Victor Lee. I am a, a legal, I am a um, assistant managing, managing editor with the ABA Journal. Um, it hasn't been too bad here. I mean, we, we, we had a couple of days where uh, it actually rained for the first time in a long time. So that was good. Um, you know, we, we, we were fighting like high 90s earlier, you know, last week. So it's been pretty bearable otherwise. And Zach Warren. Hey there, everybody. Zach Warren, editor in chief of ALM's Legal Tech News. You also see me on law.com and other brands. Uh, it's nice here in Minneapolis. We only have like three months a year where you can actually go outside and enjoy things in Minnesota. So it's nice to be a part of that three months right now before we hit October and the inevitable like foot of snow in late October to remind you that you're in Minnesota. All right. Next up, Joe Patrice, catching up with a drink in his hand. Oh yeah, no, uh, Joe Patrice above the law and thinking like a lawyer. Uh, yeah, no, uh, it is it is hot and humid here, but I'm looking straight ahead and that window has a real dark cloud in it. So I think it's about <laughs> to probably mid show become a much more ominous uh, feel here. Sounds good. How's the weather up in uh, Rochester, New York, Nikki? Or wherever it's, you are. Uh, well, today I'm uh, by a lake, but... Um, in the general area of upstate New York, it is uh, crazy. It's super wet and rainy and thunderstorms all over the place. In Rochester right now, there are flash flood warnings. I'm not there though, so that's good. But there have been flash flood warnings where I am. So it's just rainy and um, wet. And uh, my name is Nikki Black. I'm the uh, weather reporter for upstate New York. <laughs> and uh, in my, as a side gig, I, um, I'm a legal tech evangelist of my case, Star practice management software. And I um, write articles for about legal tech for the ABA Journal Above the Law, New York Daily Record, um, and the My Case blog. You've got competition for that evangelist title now. There's a new uh, legal tech evangelist out there in the world, Samina right. Kluck. Uh, I saw that. Uh, I think there's this brand evangelist, it looks like, but there's a yeah, whole bunch of different companies hiring yeah. this position. Um, yeah. I, and this has sort of started with me and then Josh Leonard from Clio was hired a couple months later. And from there, you uh, had, although his position, I think has changed over the years, I'm not sure, but from there you've yeah. had like all sorts of people being hired into this. That's kind of cool to see. Yeah. For sure. But you are still the leading evangelist on Google in terms of my SEO search. So uh, did you, and, did uh, you do a, um, I just searched uh, legal tech evangelist. You were, I know, one. but do you have to do a, what are those searches that you do that are, um, you have to do an um, incognito search to get the true results. I did an incognito. Yep. Okay. There you go. There you go. Right, but, I'm, but I'm super impressed with no, those I results. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then uh, Molly. I'm Molly McDonough. I'm a media strategist and consultant based in the Chicago area, former editor of the ABA Journal, and currently working with Legal Talk Network on Legal Talk Today. So uh, we had uh, all gotten together and talked about the stories we were going to talk about today. And instead, we've decided to start with one none of us had planned to talk about today, but something that really just kind of came up today. Um, 
Joe, do you want to talk about it? Since I know you haven't written about it yet, but you plan to write yeah. about it. Is right. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that that makes me closest to it uh, of this particular <laughs> group. Uh, yeah. So uh, Morgan Stanley, um, if you've been following there, and we and we've talked about this on this show too. The trend of the and the inflection point that the industry is coming to down the road is we're go- whether work from home is going to be a thing that stays whether it you know or some sort of a flexible schedule uh, a lot of law firms are starting to move that direction uh, with three or four day in office plans being announced uh, is this really going to be a thing and Morgan Stanley CEO a few uh, like a week or so ago put out a statement uh, and got himself is as much media attention as he could, demanding that everybody needs to come back. And now uh, the thing that just broke is that the chief legal officer of Morgan Stanley is telling his outside counsel that they all need to come back to work. Um, that, you know, the, the profession, we, we have no, I think there's a line, like, we have no doubts that law firms that have everyone in the office will perform better work than uh, law firms that don't do that. Uh, and so he's saying that uh, everybody needs to come back. And with that said, uh, I kind of thought, given that there's only one client that seems to be pushing this in every vector possible, legal, news, press, whatever, that uh, I think there might be one bank on the street who's really heavily underwater on commercial <laughs> real estate, because uh, I don't really know what other reason they would have for this, but, but I'm kind of a follow the money sort of person, so... I'm always suspicious when somebody says they they have no doubt that, yeah. all, that something will happen, and then and then don't proceed to provide any evidence whatsoever. <laughs> well, I mean, my my initial reaction to this was was that it wasn't totally crazy because uh, it's it's somewhat reasonable for a client to take the position that. Uh, Law that that community that that law firms are more secure environments for uh, in, exchanging communications and, and documents and, and whatever else. There have been any number of studies. I think one just came out today that suggested that uh, uh, you know work from home has resulted in a, a surge of uh, cybersecurity incidents. But that was before I read the letter. I still haven't read the letter. But based on what you said, Joe, there, there's no reference to that whatsoever. So that doesn't, doesn't appear to, to be, be I, the reason. Let me check again. But yeah, <laughs> it seemed to be very much about productivity. Well, but notably, what I had mentioned this when we were talking about this earlier, Morgan Stanley has been um, just made the news because of they themselves have been breached. So uh, <laughs> it was a pretty big breach. So I posted that in the chat, but um, it, I thought it was interesting you brought security up because I don't think that you knew that when you raised that, Bob. And, no, I, did, um, I didn't. No. Yeah, yeah. So they, I wonder if that may have uh, maybe um, a larger factor at play than um, you may be onto something there too. I think you both might be. I'm not sure, but they had a, a big breach <laughs> and it happened while everybody was out. So. And I'd actually rate, wanted to talk about Catherine Rubino's article on a similar note. Uh, in Above the Law about the, the, the managing partner of a, I guess, Amwal 100 firm or at least office in Atlanta who uh, was sort of spouting off, maybe is the right way uh, of putting it, about the importance of, of being in uh, all the lawyers being in the office and uh, how that you couldn't have any sort of personal relationships uh, remotely, which is probably news to a goodly number of people who have done that remotely for many, many years. Uh, I, I, for example, traveled most of my career and did, had a, a pretty good relationship, maybe as far as I knew, with my wife, even though I wasn't home all the time. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, just as I was reading this, you know, I was thinking, Molly, as, as you know, we, we, Molly and I are participants in Ari Kaplan's virtual lunch that's been going on for a year. And, you know, I think we have, at least I have forged a number of relationships through that, that virtual sort of situation that I never would have had otherwise. And so I, I just, uh, I'm sort of wondering how this is all going to play out. Uh, I know Paul Hastings came out with a big uh, policy about return to work. And now they're kind of, 
kind of walking walking it back. And um, it's a good article today by uh, by Bruce Love about uh, you know associates voting with their feet and uh, going perhaps going to going to go to firms or leave firms that are very very strict about this and head for firms that that are not so strict. And so it's. Um, it's just, I don't know. I will, I will say this. I went to my first in-person meeting in a year and a half this past week, and I was very excited to go and really looking forward to it. And the meeting was supposed to be an hour and a half and about two and a half hours into it, I sort of wondered to myself, God, I really didn't miss this at all. <laughs> this is, you know, it was something about an in-person meeting where people felt entitled to sort of spout off and to pontificate when they never did before. But so, so all of which is a good way of, I guess, saying that I hope we're not going to knee jerk into everybody come back and be exactly like it was before without pausing to consider that there are pluses and minuses to, to every sort of change like that. And sometimes the, the pluses of being remote are, uh, are, are more than the minuses. Morgan Stanley CLO just expressed in paper and it got in public with some clients were thinking not all I really don't think all of them I think some of them are just kind of like yeah we, we worked um you know work we work with our outside counsel well with everything being remote we still had access to them this uh this um quality of the work was still the same but I definitely think there's clients out there that are just like I want I want them in the office like I'm requiring my people to be in office I don't know if that makes a ton of sense and Morgan Stanley, like their arguments made, really didn't make a ton of sense to me, but we've seen when they were saying like, oh, lawyers, apprenticeship, they develop better when they're in the office. We've even seen like law firm partners say that like um, months prior, like that's why um, with their argument of why um, firms need to go back into the office. So it'll be interesting to see like what Steve was saying, like, will they just revert back to um, the status quo? Because I don't think all clients will um, say like, hey, we we want our outside counsel back in the office. I think some of them, they'll just figure like as long as the quality is still there, you know, do what you need to do. Yeah. But like my colleagues mentioned in the article, you know, law firms, they tend to kind of follow um, others, like we saw with the associate bonuses. And if they think like, oh, we may lose work from large financial institutional clients, they'll say, and I think one of um, my unnamed sources, like a law firm leader said like, okay, with our return to office policies, now with like a Morgan Stanley saying what they said, that makes our um, request to our employees seem a little bit less arbitrary. It's just kind of like, okay, we have, client, we have a client saying like they want everyone back into the office. So it would kind of be interesting. I still don't think it's all corporations that really care too much about the outside counsel coming in, but I do think there is like a, a percentage of them that are kind of like, okay, we want them back in office as well. Well, and just kind of piggyback off that. I mean, I think that I, I agree with Victoria. I mean, I think that you know it's very much a copycat uh, culture, especially amongst the big law firms. But I'm sure, like, if you ask, like, you know, a lot of the big law firms, honestly, like, you know, either off the record or connected to a lie detector or whatever you want to say. Most of them would say we want everyone back in. We want we want things to be the way they were before the pandemic. We want everyone in the office. You know, law firms, especially big law firms, have always been about showing your face, uh, putting in the putting in the FaceTime, making sure you're you're at your you're at your desk or your office or your cubicle or whatever when you're when you're when your partners see you or you know or whatnot. Make sure you're there doing the work. Make sure you're there on weekends. You know, it, it's very much sort of like a FaceTime oriented, not FaceTime the you know <laughs> the the app, but of actual like physical FaceTime oriented culture and you know law firms have always been so defensive about or so not defensive but so like you know wanting to protect their culture and culture and a lot of that is based on just seeing people there and being and being together and whatnot so i do i do wonder if this is just going to be like if, if, if especially if a client is a major client like morgan stanley is demanding you know their their lawyers return to office if that was just a way for them law firms just be like, all right well hey when us come back in what can we do you know clients are always right Victor, your your well, I mean, I, law firm sit down for a lie detector test is absolutely great. Maybe that could be a special issue of the ABA I would, Journal. I would, I would host that show on on, on television. I, I mean, there, there are a lot of questions I would ask, but I don't I don't know if uh, they'd be appropriate for a lie detector type show. Well, you know, and, and to Joe's Joe's point, I mean, uh, an entity like Morgan Stanley does have a, probably a significant financial interest, not just in their own buildings, but in the buildings of all these people they have loaned and entities they've loaned money to that could suffer severe economic problems if, if, if they don't come back and, and rents aren't paid. And so 
you know, there's no no discounting the the financial interest. But you know, to Victoria's point, there there are there would be situations, for example, where your client the client's law firm is in the same building and it's you know, very convenient to have meetings and pop in and you know have discussions and that's valuable and important. You know, certainly in, in my career, I, I I didn't have any clients that that were like that or really were not in town. So I was yeah. always dealing with them remotely and yeah. they, they didn't care. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Molly, then Joe them. was going to comment next to me. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I was just going to throw in yeah. that one of the, one of the um, issues that you would, you would assume it would be security, but that's not what the letter said. So it was right. performance right. based. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I do think there are legitimate reasons for risk and compliance until I started seeing so many of these products coming back into the market or being improved on the market, including one I saw demoed uh, with some updates um, at during legal week, which is uh, Microsoft 365 um, security and compliance. Um, that was a really interesting tool that you know, integrates with your email, whether you're remote or or um, in person and really, you know, helps flag some significant risk uh, um, among employees that you can you can help manage. And Steve, this is the direction I thought you were going to go in, Steve, with Ari's lunch. Um, the last month has been sponsored by LitLingo, which is also um, flags communications for security and compliance uh, for for the user. So it actually helps the user understand if they're about to send something risky. There's also some back end review of this too, but it's a really interesting tool to help the user understand if they're sending things that are inappropriate or you know, you, using or attaching documents or information that they shouldn't be attaching. Um, so I think a lot of these tools are going to eliminate um, some of those excuses for coming back that it's that it's um, for security. I think there are lots of other ways companies can be securing their information um, to avoid this like incredible flood of data breaches that happen that's been happening during the pandemic. Um, but I do I don't think we're there yet. So you know is the safest place may still be back at the office where all the security protocols are in place. Um, yeah. But as somebody mentioned in the comments, um, you know, variants are coming and we could be heading to another shutdown. So I, you know, I think the best approach is still to be prepared for a hybrid. Yeah, no shutdowns till after ILTA. Joe, you were gonna? Um, less a comment than a quip uh, when we head off of- uh, <laughs> My favorite when, though. <laughs> when Victor, well, I mean, between, when, between Victoria and Victor's uh, comments about how uh, a client asking for something gives cover and kind of like pushes the issue forward, but also maybe only when it's what people really, what people in the firm really wanted. Cause my, when it was about the client, that I, all I could think is that didn't work out well for Coca-Cola. Like the client made demands and the firm's, ignored him until until he lost his job uh which is kind of a sad uh commentary on it but yeah it was like it only works it only works when the client demands things occasionally yeah. well and i'm gonna throw out something i feel like is not talked about very often or enough and that's the psychological aspects of men in power and so and i i generalizing by saying men but men tend to be the ones in power and oftentimes you know you see the studies that ceos and law firm leaders and surgeons, there's lots of narcissists that are in these positions of power. And narcissists, um, there, there's a two, two issues. A, people that are narcissistic tend to need people around them to feed their ego, and that doesn't work nearly as well over Zoom. And B, and I, I've told this story before, um, the, the point is that a lot of men escape things that are happening at home by going to work. Um, and I'm generalizing because it's not all men, but um, men do this. And my favorite example of that is years ago when I was an associate in a law firm, um, there was a huge snowstorm and I couldn't get in even though I'd grown up in upstate New York. And when I finally got into the office, I was the second person there. And the first person was one of the partners. And I said, I can't believe you got into the office. How'd you get into the office so quickly? And he said, are you kidding? Stay at home with my family and kids on a snow day? Forget about it. And he was joking, but I don't think he was joking. And so <laughs> I do think That's that a good. lot of, <laughs> a lot of people, um, and probably I, I wouldn't, I don't want to just say men, um, going to the office is gets you away from your home. It gives you a break. It gives you some space. And I think that people that are tend to be extroverted also 
need that as well. So I think there's a lot of psychological things that are playing. People play up the business aspects and the business reasons, but there's a lot of psycho psychological drivers behind these decisions as well, I think. That's a, yeah. that's a really excellent point, Nikki. And it's, it's, it, it, it's kind of shaping up like a, like a generational conflict almost with, with the old white guys wanting to make things like it was and a new generation of, of younger lawyers that, that like the remote and the flexibility. And that, to, to me, that's the really interesting thing is, is this sort of this push and shove that there, that's going on. And you know, typically for years, the old white guys would always win. And now, you know, it, maybe they will, but you know, there seems to be enough competition for associates that there's some, some flexibility there. Yeah, yeah, that was my knee jerk reaction to this too, not only from the outside counsel perspective, but even within Morgan Stanley is if you're a high powered attorney who is able to kind of pick and choose where they want to go as presumably everybody who's going to be working at Morgan Stanley is, wouldn't that be paramount and kind of one of the very first things you look at is how flexible are they in how they work with their attorneys? Why, if I'm a very high ranking aspiring lawyer, why would I want to go to that place that is that inflexible when I could go to another major bank, another major institution that is a little bit more flexible in how they work and able to listen to their younger attorneys, their people who do want to work flex, uh, with that flexibility. Um, I think it definitely could backfire in that way. I mean, I think you do have to take into account that in the financial services industry, there are external industry uh, regulations and, and legal legal mandates that, that you know, are, are gonna inhibit their ability to be flexible as a yeah. workplace. And, and, and I, I, those are, you know, if you're the chief legal officer of a major financial institution, you, you can't ignore those. But again, that's not what he talked about in this letter. So it, it's hard to say that that has anything to do with the decision here. Um, I'm gonna suggest we move on to another topic uh, because we've got a number to get to here. Uh, and uh, this, this past week was uh, more, was this the end of legal week year? It was. I'm, I'm losing track of my of legal week five. year calendar. Yes. Um, so legal week year has come to an end, but uh, it was actually a, a, some good programming this week. Uh, and, and one that I, I, I know uh, several sources wrote about and covered and, and attended, and Zach, you had brought this up, was this one on uh, whether the legal tech market is uh, on the verge of a, a, a bubble. Uh, you want to talk yeah. a little bit about that? Well, I thought it was interesting. I mean, the panel was essentially that. It was just kind of talking about there's been so much money flowing into legal technology. There are a bunch of startups right now. Is this potentially a bubble that could burst at some time, or is it still a boom and there's still a lot of growth to be had? Um, the panelists there pretty much universally said, no, there's still a lot of room for growth just in terms of adoption rates and areas of the law that can be automated. There is still a lot to happen here. So we're not necessarily in a bubble right now. And they define bubble very narrowly as in a time when um, particularly the major players start to kind of fall off a little bit because there's no room for them to grow and thus entrants don't have any room to grow either if even the big players aren't growing. Um, and I think you are seeing pretty clearly the big players are still growing in this industry. It, the yeah. main thing for me is it just got me thinking whether a bubble could be on the horizon or just kind of even prognosticating how far out that would need to be. Um, I think it's tough to look at right now just because the rate of change within legal is still pretty high and there's still a lot of processes to be automated. I just thought it was kind of an interesting topic to bandy ba about back and forth just because I think a lot of people continue to look at the growth of legal tech without kind of taking that step back and saying, oh, would we even know if there is a problem here, essentially? Yeah. Molly, you were at that you uh, watched it. What did you think? I, I thought it was really interesting. I, you know, I've been kind of focused on this idea of what legal tech is um, and whether legal tech is a thing. Uh, and I really think that that question got answered for me in a, in a good way um, with um, oh, Daryl, is it Shetterly? Shet, uh, yeah. From um, oh, Oric yeah. Observatory. Um, he, I thought he really, and he, and he still didn't answer the question about, you know, what, what is operational 
only that cross it, it you know operational that crosses um, different sectors and is not purely legal or you know tools just for lawyers and legal um, and still that hasn't completely shaken out yet so when they were to, they use this baseball analogy with where we are in tech and i think what we're not even zach somebody said not even out of the out of the dugout <laughs> or we haven't and somebody said we haven't mm. finished singing the national anthem or just right. finished so like you know really still early in the early stages nowhere near a um, um a, a bubble right yeah i i um i thought it was a really good panel too i i, I watched it um and uh the one I, I was talking about this before we, we started recording today that one of the things that struck me about it wasn't so much the whole bubble question as there was a lot of discussion on the panel about how do you how do you kind of sort through all the hype in the legal tech world and all the hype that's coming out of the companies I know this is something we've talked about on this panel before but it's something I feel I just I struggle with all the time as a writer because I I don't want to be played for a sucker <laughs> by by companies that tell me a whole bunch of stuff about their products that I have no way really of verifying uh you know i was saying before we started I, there, there's some products that i am capable of testing and trying myself uh there are others that as a sole practitioner uh you know uh sitting here by myself in my office i i just i don't have the staff or or the resources to, to test out these products and so i really have to accept uh companies representations often about them and often those representations tend to be very generic i mean they tend to often all say more or less the same thing uh, if they're in the same market or have the same kind of a product uh and you know i, I thought like itai garari was on the panel he's the uh founder of the legal research platform judicata and he's now at since he's acquired by fast case and he's i think chief technology officer or something. I forget what his title is at Fast Case now. But, you know, I mean, he said that basically everything companies say about AI is hype, <laughs> that, that it's all hype. Uh, and uh, nobody should even be talking about AI. It's just a question of does the product, what does the product do? Does it do it well or not? And, and forget whether it's AI or not. Um, you know, so I, I just think it's a really interesting issue to try and sort through as a writer about legal tech, because I, I just, I, I, I struggle with it almost every day. I don't even think it's a writer question. I think even the people who are in the trenches who are oh, yeah. in operations, everybody's asking that question right now. I mean, you even just see it from the fact that somebody like LexFusion has a viable business model by being able to kind of sort through these things and verify and then be able to go to their clients and say, this works. Um, a lot of people are looking for kind of that external validation because unless you get something in there and have a very long RFP or proof of concept, it's tough to verify a lot of times, especially with how many different tools are out there. Well, yeah, but like the guy from Warwick was, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Nikki. Um, well, I was gonna say with my ABA journal articles where I write about different categories of legal software each month, I always end them by saying, you've got to test the software out yourself because you know, people always want either bar associations to give the green light, which they won't do. They'll never say we prefer this. They'll say we partner, but they won't say this is the best choice. They won't say this is the most secure. Um, and lawyers also want check marks, like checklists, like which has these features and which doesn't. But to your point, Bob, they can say it has this feature, but how does the feature actually function and work? And that's why I always tell lawyers and th that they need to have a few people, including some stakeholders that are not necessarily lawyers, test the software out, try it out with a couple different cases or with a bunch of different contracts as the case may be. Narrow it down to two companies, test their software out and see which works the best and see which ones you have a buy-in from with your uh, um, staff and everyone that's gonna be using it because they, they don't buy in, it's not gonna get used and you're gonna be wasting your time and your investment and your money. So I, I, I totally appreciate this idea that it's difficult for journalists to, um, sort out what it all means. But I, in some ways, I don't think it's necessarily our job. We report what they're telling us. And it, at the end of the day, the customer does have to do some legwork or through LexFusion. But even then, I would suggest that there's some skin in the game. They have skin in the game by partnering with these companies too. So at the end of the day, the, the customer has to try it out. The law firm has to try it out and see what works best. You just have to. Like it's, well, it's, um, it's just there's a narrow uh, journalistic place between um, the sort of place you go, and I, I'm, I'm a purveyor, I am not purveyor, I'm a consumer of products like video games or something, and I go to websites where they say, 
we played this and this is what it looks like three out of four stars like there's the kind of journalism that says hey this is a three out of four star thing and the kind that just says this has been released and this is what we know about it but we don't know we don't know what that means for you and kind of parsing that and walking that line can be difficult for people because i think we all know where that is i think but somebody reading may not and they may read me say something and say like oh you said this was great and i was like no i said it did the things the company told me it said it did and i compared that to claims other people made but that's different than me saying five stars you know uh it's yeah, it's it's an interesting question. And whether or not the audience knows that we're walking that line is a question too, like whether we're conveying that we're on one side of it or not. Yeah, and I, I should be clear that when I was saying it's difficult to test these, I'm talking to, it's to some extent about the, the products that are really designed for sort of enterprise scale uh, operations uh, where you know, uh, you need some bulk of, of, of whether it's contracts or, or deals or whatever else it is, even to be able to kind of get started on the software, let alone test it out. You know, I thought that the guy from Oric was, it was interesting when, when people were asking him why Oric Observatory doesn't sort of put more of the background information uh, that, that Oric develops about these products. But I mean, he talked about the fact that, you know, Oric as a firm has, all these resources in terms of IT staff and innovation staff and whatever else who can go out and vet these products and try them out and test them out. And they put a lot of time and resources into this. Uh, most law firms just don't have those kinds of resources available to them to, to put that kind of time and effort into testing products. Um, you know, so. Yeah, I, that was that was a really good, interesting date. Daryl said that they had 150 people with Oric Observatory doing that work. Right. Like, that's amazing to me. Yeah. <laughs> so they're doing a lot of vetting, but, you know, the question was, um, you know, is how do you distinguish the hype? And the and he said that that observatory is not how you decide that. And so, you know, it's still it's it's a good resource as a, you know, as a place to go, but it's still not going to help you do what Nikki said and what you're talking about, which is, you know, demo the product, see if it works in your environment for the type of work you're doing. And a lot of that especially enterprise requires a lot of level of customization before you can really even see that. So that test, you know, that testing is, is difficult to do. And I, and mm -hmm. I don't have an answer to the question other than Lex, you know, more of the same of Lex fusion or what Joe's talking about, which is, you know, better ratings, so customer ratings. So we can start to see how the, how the, the competition is, is faring. Uh, what I did learn is that funding um, is not an indicator. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, just, not hard to get funding, at least um, in the beginning, from your friends if you have a good idea or they like you. Um, well, you could do so, Morgan Stanley into giving you money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it is a difficult problem all the way around because I was just sitting here thinking, you know, many of these products, particularly that that are litigation oriented, and until you actually use them with a case or cases, you. It's, it's almost impossible to assess how good or not good that they are. So, but then you're left with the question, if, if you're a law firm, using an unknown product on a case could detrimentally impact your client, both so, you know, from a, from a yeah, cost standpoint know, I, I or mean, results standpoint. So you, there, you know, it's kind of a hard, it's a difficult sort of thing for all the way around, I think, for people to get their heads around and deal with. Look, we say, you know, Steve and I've seen a lot of um, demos on, on Ari Kaplan's um, lunch. They, he's been doing that like every week for over a year at this point um, with, with um, some um, background behind the scenes tours and some of the best for, especially for litigation uh, companies that I've seen really do a good job partnering with clients to do that work so that the clients have done some rigorous testing that then you can see in the demo. Um, you know, they anonymize it, you know, however they need to do it, but they do have some real world examples to share. And I think that's one way that, that startups can do that. But, you know, you have to get somebody to trust you or you have to come up with some really sophisticated hypotheticals. Yeah. Um, there was another uh, panel this week uh victoria that you uh brought up i think on uh on uh remote court hearings Can yeah you tell us about the, that 
the last keynote speak, uh, pa keynote panel for Legal Week year 2021 was the judges panel. And one of the main things that they brought up, the main topics that they brought up was um, federal court proceedings um, being conducted remotely. And it sounds like from the panelists that it was a success. And they said like, but of course, like council had the option of like remotely participating in proceedings via um, telephone or video conferencing, but it didn't really happen before the pandemic. But because of the pandemic, a lot of judges said they were leveraging that tool and they said they found a lot of efficiencies with it, especially, and they said they could see longevity with using those platforms, you know, beyond the pandemic, mostly for like non-evidentiary or maybe oral arguments. And I thought it was interesting, especially because the uh, CARES Act, um, an exemption in the CARES Act allowed um, public access to, to the federal courts via telephone and video conferencing. But the CARES Act exemption will expire at some point. But according, and it's kind of interesting because it kind of ties into like Morgan Stanley saying, oh, lawyers need to go back into the office and you know, in-person is better. When you have federal judges saying like, we think that um, remote uh, court proceedings are actually more efficient and more effective for the, um, for the uh, corporate clients and for the uh, uh, lawyers in the court system. And they're already starting to think of ways of like, how can we continue this and still allow public access to the courts, um, especially if the uh, CARES Act uh, limits the uh, ability to have like video conferencing public uh, access. So I thought it was interesting and just kind of like, a sharp uh, contrast to like what Morgan Stanley is saying, like, oh, it has to be better to be in person. When you have the federal court system saying that they're able to do their jobs and their customers, the lawyers, the um, clients are able to do their job more effectively when you don't have to be in person for every single thing, but it can still get, get done. I saw the same panel, Victoria. And one thing I thought was really interesting was the one judge, and it kind of goes back to, you know, you have to assess your situation and what's good may be good for you, but may not be good for the fellow judge. But one judge was saying she really liked telephonic hearings, not in-person hearings or Zoom hearings, because she said, I'm, I'm a very expressive person and I tend to give like too many clues that the lawyers can see if they can, if they can see me. So it's really, for me, it's much better to be tele telephonic so they don't get those kind of clues. That, that to me, I've, I had never thought of that to be quite honest, but it was really, really interesting. <laughs> Of course, isn't the flip side of that that the judge isn't getting the clues from the witnesses or the lawyers that you know that, that right. they get uh, visually? Well, and and uh, some sometimes, uh, well, like so, this is not. Uh, I've never been a judge, been a mediator, but not a judge. Uh, and so, uh, but like I've judged debate rounds and stuff, and I'm very expressive. And I feel like at some point, you as a judge owe it to the advocates to show I'm not buying it do something else um you know, like and you can show that and then and that as a when i gave oral arguments occasionally i would see some but something not working and i would go oh well i need to slow down stop this part move to the next part and, and that's important part of the process too so telephonic isn't as good as zoom like i i think you do want as a judge to give away what you're thinking a little bit yeah rest something my, the my US Sorry. Oh, in the U.S. Supreme Court, they said they didn't like telephonic uh, arguments because you couldn't read from the justices, like, were they buying like their argument or were they not? But I think, what was it, um, Justice Thomas, uh, Clarence Thomas, he said he kind of liked it because they had to be a little bit more considerate of like, okay, you have time for your arguments and everything like that. So it's a little bit of pros and cons. I can personally just see a preference for video conferencing because you know when someone's speaking, you don't necessarily need someone to say like, what's your name before you say something. It's just kind of like, you know, Zoom, hopefully you have your name that pops up. So that's a little bit more clear to know who's speaking. Yeah, like my, my, my very first jury trial when I, uh, when I went back when I practiced, um, you know, I was still, you know, and obviously I didn't know what I was doing. I barely knew what I was doing. And, uh, my, my judge happened to be like a former prosecutor who, you know, clearly thought that the guy was guilty. Um, and so one thing that I picked up on was that whenever, whenever I missed an objection, he would immediately stare at me as if he was expecting me to stand up and object. So it got to the point where like, he would just stare at me and I'd be, Oh, objection, your honor. So, um, you know, not, not to say everyone, everyone's experience is going to be like that, but, um, I, I, I do think that um, you know you you lose you lose a lot when you do a telephonic conference uh, or a, or a, you know I mean obviously you know the you know like 
not having the not having the jury there, not being able to see what they're thinking, not being able to see what the, the other parties, not being able to see the judge. I do think there's a lot that that, that gets lost in 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 and in, in not being able to in losing that visual element, kind of like what we were talking about earlier with regards to listening to this, listening to, the, to this to this uh, uh, you know um, uh, roundtable as opposed to just watching it on on, on live or on YouTube. So um so 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 that's interesting. But also, I mean, you know. I mean, I didn't. I I missed the panel, but it's kind of, I'm just reading the reading the uh, the, the the write up. You know, it, it'll be interesting to, to to see to see what you know what other judges think about think about it. Because I mean, you know, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, Rakoff was a pretty forward looking judge, especially regarding like technology and whatnot. And you know, um, uh, Andrew Peck on there, like he was he was very big into like technology when he was on the bench. Um, you know, so obviously you have people who are already kind of predisposed to like liking to. To, to predispose to liking, you know, integrated technology into into their courtrooms to begin with. So it'll be interesting to see what the rest of the bench and and and, and you know, maybe maybe judges who aren't as as inclined to like utilize technology or open to it. What you know, what what they would think about it. Well, yeah, there's think, some. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just about to say, I think that's a very good point that especially a lot of these panels that are talking about remote work are somewhat self-selecting because they're people that have tried it, like it and really want it to be adopted. But with that said, I also think a lot of those judges that have tried it are also the best ones to give feedback and kind of teach the rest of the judiciary, okay, this is what works, this is what doesn't, and kind of come to a consensus that way because nobody teaches judges better than other judges a lot of times. It's easier to learn something from your peers than having the general commentary it say, oh, this is something that you should do. Um, so being able to learn from experience, particularly within the past 12 months, whether or not it is accepted widely, I at least think it's helpful to have that as a base to start the conversation moving forward. And um, and, in, and in regard to this idea that um, the panel was forward thinking and maybe that colored some of the perception, uh, I'm in upstate New York, and I would deferentially suggest or uh, that we are not, I would not say that the judiciary or the lawyers here are um, as easy to adopt tech as, uh, or eager to adopt tech as other uh, more metropolitan areas. So we're, you know, a little more uh, overall reluctant to do that. And um, during the pandemic, there were some judges- Somebody who, disagrees is what I hear. Right? <laughs> Right. Vehemently. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. I'll just say. Short like, who do you think you some... are, Buffalo? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the short and sweet of it is that there were some judges here who agreed, who thought that um, really liked Zoom and indicated that they never would have thought they'd be Zooming previously, but um, that they definitely plan to do it for more um, routine court appearances. So I do think that judges who weren't tech um, were tech averse really took to it here and i don't think that that's uh they're the minority i'd say they're the majority and with that i'm gonna mute myself yeah so all, all during the uh the past year so many of us on this panel and so many others uh, all through all sorts of other uh, sources were saying you know there, there's no going back we've made these changes and there's no going back but i think what we're seeing now to some extent is is people trying to define what no going back really looks like it's not a black and white I, there are all sorts of nuances to to the issue i mean I, i'm dealing with this in some of the issues i am you know I, I do lobbying in my in my law work on behalf of the newspaper industry and, and one of the big issues now in our legislature is you know to what extent how should government meetings now be held going forward people people some people really like just watching government meetings you know via zoom uh but other people weren't able to attend via Zoom because they don't have computers or they don't have broadband or they don't get how to do it. Uh, so now, now what should government meetings look like? Should we go back to the old way? Should we have some new hybrid model? Should we go entirely uh, online all the time? Uh, you know, and they're not, they're not easy questions because there are, uh, there are uh, people on, on all sides of the issue who get affected differently by it. What else did we have here this week? We had uh, Molly. Do you want to talk about keyword advertising? Sure, sure. This is from uh, last month, uh, and I don't think we got a chance to get to it, um, or I, I didn't see it, um, that Ohio um, issued an opinion um, banning uh, competitive keyword advertising. And I'm actually going to put in the link from Eric Goldman's piece, which was a really excellent takedown 
of the um, of the opinion. And it seems like, it, you know, at, at first blush, it seems like it makes sense that you're like, oh, don't, you can't buy the law firm's name. That's, you know, a, a terrible thing to do um, because it's anti-competitive. Well, you know, there are a lot of legitimate reasons you would buy your advertising against a law firm for competitive reasons, for comparative reasons to, you know, say your, your, you're smaller, but just as as qualified or have more experience or, you know, there are lots of different reasons. And, um, you know, Eric Goldman's uh, position on this was that um, that uh, the the opinion really just didn't cite any rational rational reasons why to ban the competitive keywords uh, advertising. So um, and it kind of went against the grain um, and, you know, took like a several like a decade step back into you know the uh, users understanding of competitive advertising that they they don't when you're doing searches this isn't your expectation um, that the competitive keywords would be used this way so i thought it was really interesting what about the question of whether it's deceptive as opposed to anti-competitive right so he he the, his argument is that it's not deceptive um, because it's not used the way that Ohio is um, assuming it's being used. Uh, it, that, that it's very unusual for it to be used as a way um, to, you know, just supplant another, another firm. And uh, um, Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, uh, Gies Sakalakis did a, a nice um, um, review of this too. And he, he made that you know, when you're in a small area and you're doing that type of advertising, you're going to kill your own reputation. So it's a it's a really bad way for you to be known in your own area um, to be competing this way, uh, buying buying competitive terms. Any other thoughts on that? Should we move on to uh, Nikki? Do you want to bring up her story? Yeah, I just thought this was interesting because I'm always interested in the intersection of privacy and technology. And it was uh, an article that talked about how Maine um, has banned, it's the first state to um, pass broad government, a governmental ban, uh, pass broad government ban on facial recognition tech, meaning that um, they, let me post this in the chat, the, they basically said that for the most part, the government in Maine cannot use facial recognition technology. Uh, there was a narrow exception, which was for the police in particularly serious cases where, um, but they could not use their own tech. They had to go to the FBI or I believe it was the CIA, um, <clears throat> Bureau, oh, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, not the CIA. <laughs> um, big difference there, oh, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I think it, um, I, for one, think it's a very good move because um, of all the issues we've talked about in the past, in particular, how AI, uh, the underlying algorithms are um, biased because of the programming, uh, unintentionally so, but they are biased, especially for towards people of color and women's faces. They are very good at um, identifying white men's faces very fairly accurately, and that's about it. And so when AI is used, it's off um, to identify people, especially for crimes, it's often um, incorrect in terms of the conclusions that it um, leads to. So I, I think that it's important to regulate AI, uh, especially facial recognition technology. Um, and I think that this is a step in the right direction and it, not just facial re recognition, but AI in general, because I think Skynet is le a legitimate threat. This idea of um, AI gaining sentience and Killing, killing all of us here humans. So, um, <laughs> and there are definitely people out there that agree with me that are um, a lot smarter than I am when it comes to those issues. And there are people that disagree. But um, <clears throat> either way, I thought it was a notable, um, uh, a notable um, regulation that had been passed and that hopefully other states will do the same thing. Cause I think it's important. And I think sometimes people aren't paying enough attention to facial recognition and how invasive it is and how pervasive it is right now without much regulation. I didn't get a chance to read the article in depth, but I noticed that it, it made a reference to the fact that there is a exception carved out for law enforcement investigations of certain kinds. So isn't that what we're most worried about with the software in the first place? I mean, uh, what what is the nature of that carve out? 
well, it's for particularly serious crimes. I'm not sure how they define serious crimes. And also that it um, did not allow them to use the technology themselves, but to instead use the DMVs or the FBI's. Um, and so uh, I, I think what's important about that is that there is some oversight and it's not just um, a wide open free for all, which is what it has been in the past. Um, but I, I agree that I think it's important for that uh, clarity on that. And I didn't read the um, actual uh, um, bill or law that was passed on that. So I'm not sure. Um, well, slight, slight addendum to this. I went to a, uh, so a lot of people, uh, like there, there are nefarious uses of facial facial recognition technology, obviously. And, but there, one of the things that sometimes it get you, gets used for is identifying just like this is where people are within this pic that these are where people are within this picture for the purposes of uh deposition like creating exhibits and whatever and i actually saw a demo from a vendor that i am blanking on at the moment who was talking about in light of the facial recognition problems they had gone out and developed an algorithm that's able to tell that you have like a shoulder with a head on it basically and say this is a person and we're not going to say what person or try to do that but these are people so that if you're trying to code like a long series of things it's like oh this is when people appear in it as opposed to when they don't so that somebody can review it later and be like oh this is the part of the security camera footage where people were or whatever it would be able to do that and i was like that's really clever like you found a way to get like the function that people want without bringing in all the horrible stuff. Uh, I thought it was an interesting twist and one that people in Maine probably need to uh, learn about. Yeah, I think that's kind of interesting too, just how pervasive a law like this would be. I know we had a series of contributed articles from lawyers at uh, Blank Rome that basically talked about virtual try-on technology. Like you want to buy a hat or a shirt, go ahead and upload your face and see how it looks on you sort of deal, which obviously I would think would fall directly under exactly what this law is trying to do. The way that the article said is, well, make sure you bring in privacy counsel early, have arbitration waivers, stuff like that. It was mostly talking about the um, BIPA in Illinois as compared to just a flat ban or something like this. But I think particularly as technology evolves and kind of that interactivity, particularly online of what a lot of retailers are doing, um, I think that's going to be kind of tricky for lawyers to navigate and particularly laws like this, what exactly they're carving out, what it falls under it, what doesn't fall under it, I think will be very tricky and probably lead to a lot of litigation. Yeah, I mean, just, just reading over the article that, that, that Nikki linked to, it said, law enforcement can only ask for searches on subjects of, of interest in pictures or video if they do not have another means of identifying them. It's like, well, what's to stop a law enforcement officer from to say, oh, couldn't identify them. We need to use, we, we need to use, the, the, we need to use the, the, the facial recognition. And sorry, you know, we tried. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, it, it's, one of, it's one of the things where the devil's in the detail. But one thing, one thing I thought was interesting is, is it talks about uh, Washington State's law, which was passed last year. It said, it said that the main law is much stronger than the Washington law, and probably because uh, they noted that um, the, the law was written, the, the Washington law was written by a state senator who also works as a program manager at Microsoft. And I kind of felt like, well, that seems like that would be, uh, <laughs> that would raise ethical issues that I wouldn't care to speculate on. Um, and so, so um, I guess, you know, hopefully the main law is, is coming from a better place than that or a more um, you know, yeah, like, but, but, but I still see, I just, just, just looking at it superficially, like I, I, yeah, like just, I could see all kinds of issues with it. Just, you know, just that, that any, that any, any, any competent law enforcement officer could just drive a truck through it. Well, it doesn't it presume uh, if law, if law enforcement can still use it in certain, certain circumstances, then it would presume that the, the information is still being collected somewhere for them to use. And if it's still being collected out there for, for them to use, then there is still all sorts of potential for abuse somehow. So I mean, it's I, you know, it, it's a good thing that they passed this law, but it seems to be uh, it seems to have a few uh, Swiss cheese size holes in it. Uh, and as it seems. I hadn't heard of this um, ban by Maine until Nikki brought it up. But it's interesting because this week, um, this guy that was falsely arrested because like a police um, 
a police force in Detroit um, said that he committed a crime based off of like some facial recognition technology, but it actually was inaccurate and he actually didn't do the crime. And he ended up suing like the um, police department. He testified in front of like a house subcommittee about like facial recognition technology and its shortcomings and just kind of pressed for this law, I guess, Democrats are going, um, trying to uh, pass like the facial recognition and biometric technology moratorium. So it's kind of interesting, like, of course, I'm assuming it's not going to go anywhere, but kind of interesting that you are starting to see like it pick up a little bit. And of course, this man um, um, being arrested, being falsely accused, stemming from like facial recognition technology, I kind of assume is that going to be like the DNA test, like back in what was it, the early 2000s or something, like a lot of guys got like multi-million dollar settlements because DNA proved like, oh, they didn't actually commit the crime. Like, are we going to actually see we use facial recognition technology? People went to jail and maybe even got a guilty conviction. And it's actually like it was based off like some inaccurate facial recognition technology. So. Yep. Yeah, oh, I, they, I, they, they, I they disagree a little bit. Qualified with immunity. Well, I should disagree a little bit with what you said, Victoria, not because of, but like, you know, I found, I mean, just, just isn't the Republicans hate, hate big tech just as much, if not more than Democrats do these days. So, I, so I could see that being like the one area of common ground that they have in this Congress. So if anything could possibly be done to like, plus, you know, I mean, I think, I think facial, I believe facial recognition was used pretty extensively to identify people on the January 6th um, uh, insurrection. Yeah. So I could, I could definitely see, you know, some like bipartisan support for some kind of facial recognition ban or moratorium. <laughs> Yeah. But the Supreme Court's not going to give up on qualified immunity anytime soon. So, yeah, um, we're just about out of time, Victor. I know you were going to talk about a story about uh, working from home fueling cyber attacks. I think we've kind of, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, bounced I think, I think that around a little bit already in the course of this discussion. Uh, I was just going to mention the uh, Lexus Plus announcement this week that incorporates the Law 360 uh, news in the Lexus uh, Plus, which is kind of a a, a half a, a half baked uh, thing. I mean, it's it's good that it's in there, but you you still can't get the full access to any of the stories unless you happen to be a Law 360 subscriber. So you can get the get the headlines right within Lexus Plus, but you don't get the stories unless you pay in that extra subscription so uh but it's still it's still an interesting move for lexus plus i think that's it anything else anybody wanted to raise this week before we wrap up hope uh everybody's weather conditions improve for the weekend and uh maybe by next week summer will arrive somewhere we'll be back next week i think thanks to everybody for watching and listening